All right, so we are going to talk a little bit about dry sump engines. There we go. So up at the screen. Remember, a dry sump engine, the reason why you have a dry sump is because there's something about the installation of the engine that you can't fit an oil sump down below it. So you can't have the 12 quarts or whatever you're going to need. So you only have a very small amount of oil uh, capacity down below. So you have an oil cooler that is usually mounted up on the firewall or somewhere else. Now in this drawing, it shows the oil cooler below the level of the engine, which is not the case. Uh, oil cooler is actually more along the lines of the same level or even higher than the actual engine. Um, so what's going to happen is if we start right at the oil tank, of course that's full of oil, and here's the oil filler, so oil is going to go in there. And it is the engine is going to suck up the oil from the oil tank through the main uh, fuel pump, through the screen, right? Uh, this, I, this is the Bonanza oil system, so it's very specific to the Bonanza. It's funny that it has a screen here where you know most of them, the screen is afterwards, but it's going to come through the oil pump <coughs> around the, well, kind of a funny way of showing it. It's not entirely correct, but out of the oil pump, then the very next thing you're going to see is the oil pressure, oil pressure gauge, right? And so along with the oil pressure gauge down here, you're going to have the oil pressure relief valve goes through the engine and goes back into the engine case, right? Everything is pretty much normal. It's just that at this point, the tank was mounted further away. Then from here, it goes into the dry sump, which holds some oil, you know, several quarts. Uh, and then it's gonna go through a scavenge pump. The thing about a scavenger pump is that the scavenger pump is always larger I would write that down. Scavenger pump is always larger than the main pump. And the reason why is because the main pump, the main pressure pump is actually just pumping, in theory, pure oil. There shouldn't be any air in it at this point unless you have a, a bad a gasket or something. But the scavenge pump has now got all of this oil that's been aerated, so it's got air in the oil, so the oil has more volume. Therefore, you need a pump that is capable of pumping more volume. So the scavenge pump is always bigger, quite a bit bigger, about, about a third bigger. So it's very noticeable. Uh, from there, I don't care much for this drawing. I think it'd be better if it actually went like this and had two return paths. So one path goes through the oil cooler and then into the tank and the other path finds its way out and it just drips in here. Drip, drip. All right, um, so that would mean that in this area right here, you would have to have an oil temperature sensing bulb that would direct the oil one way or the other. Hopefully that made sense because it was supposed to. Uh, <clears throat> all right, then it just repeats itself. So those, dog. So that is that. What do I have down here? Uh, oil fed the engine oil pump from a supply tank mounted just above and behind the engine. The oil return is picked up by a scavenge pump, return to the supply tank, passing through the cooler, which is an integral part of the tank. And this is specific to the Bonanza. Uh, oil tank capacity is... I copied it. 2-1 to 2 gallons, the oil filler next. That's not important. All right, so that is... The dry sump. I was trying to think if there's anything else you need to know about dry sump engines. The main key is uh, for your Q&As, number one, that the scavenge pump is bigger. And number two, oil returned goes through the oil cooler and then into the tank. And that will get you through your Q&As. And we'll look at that one a little bit. Maybe. Let's go. All right. Uh, let's see, we talked about our oil screens and filters the other day. So what do we need to cover right now? Talk a little bit about oil coolers. Mini engines. 
these oil coolers. Not all. Um, some aircraft or type certificated to have them, some aren't. My particular plane I, does not come with one, but I believe there's the option to add one. Lycoming tends to use remote coolers. Remote mounted. What that means is the cooler is not integral to the engine. It is somewhere else and you need hoses. Uh, problem with that is that with hoses, um, hoses wear out, they get old, they get brittle, they crack, and people don't replace them often, especially light combing. They run the hoses right over the top of the engine, right over the cylinders and down. So they're baking off at about 400 degrees nonstop. So I say that to say, probably should change them out more often than they get changed out in the field. Uh, Continental. Tends to use coolers that are mounted to the engine. And by that, I mean they are absolutely on the engine, boom, the engine is, has been milled out for it. Um, without the oil cooler, you've got a big open space in the engine, they, they do make blank off plates. So there's no hoses, no nothing, it's just the oil cooler is bolted right there, the oil cooled the passages are inside of the engine. They go right up into the oil cooler and back and around and out and everything is inside. It's actually kind of nice. You don't have to worry about uh, any sort of hose problems. <clears throat> All right, so oil coolers. Uh, oil coolers, they, they, look, they look like small radiators. This is the kind you have in your car. It would normally have water running through it, but now it just has oil running through it. Look like small, but they have very small passages. So if they have very small passages, what is my main concern here? Blockages. Yep. Debris, blockages that catch. Catch debris. They make great oil filters. <laughs> so I have seen many of engines who have had metal made inside of the engine. And so now you've got this problem with the engine. So engine gets uh, brought in for major overhaul. Oil cooler is taken off very carefully, put in this little bag, sit on the cart. The engine is built up. Oil cooler comes out of the bag, goes back on the engine, start the engine. Guess what you just do? flush it right out and put all the metal right back in the engine. And then I've seen people actually do weird things like, oh, so one mechanic he took, like, you know, the, the washer we have over in the corner? Yeah. Basically just rigged a hose up and hooked it into the oil cooler and just um, flipped it on and let it run for a couple hours. So it, it filtered out the, uh, the cleaner nice too. Uh, don't do that. So all of my engines, we sent them out to... Uh, I think a specific oil cooler supply, a place. They actually take off one end of the oil cooler or both ends and they actually run a brush through every single passage and clean it all out. So, yeah. So if you have an engine that makes metal and somebody says, hey, we can flush it out here, just hook up to a garden hose. Fine. Uh, no, no. If you have one block passage, it'll go around and just, it'll find a way. So don't do that. Um, Trying to condense a little bit here. <clears throat> well, I'll regret it if I do. All right, so some oil coolers. I think this is a Q&A question, why I have it here. Have an inner and an outer core. So very cold oil bypasses the cooler.
And as the oil heats up, it flows through the inner core where it's cooled. Of course, you need a bypass valve to take care of that. Is there a bypass valve for the oil cooler itself if your oil, if the passengers are too locked? Uh, then you want a relief valve. Yeah. And so if the only way to get through the oil cooler, what, well, actually, let me show you. We'll talk about that. And it's kind of cool. So let's talk about this relief valve thing. Oil cooler, thermostatic, control valve. Also known as a vernotherm. Well, Prince tried to help me, and I was really hoping I could get this document camera to show on my screen what I'm going to show you so that it record. But it won't, so I can't. So if anybody has any ideas on that, let me know. So this is a vernotherm valve. No, there's two of them. Here's two vernotherm valves. One is gold and one is not. All right, so the vernotherm valve... Uh, we talked a little bit about it the other day. When they heat up, they expand. And when it gets cold, it shrinks. All right, so this is going to go into an engine passage. And you're going to have two spots where the oil can, can kind of make it through. Make it not kind of, it does. And so as the oil is cold, what's going to happen is that passage is going to be open. Kind of like uh, if we go back to this drawing. And I put a vernotherm valve so that you had a way to go this way or the other way. So the vernotherm valve, it's either going to be open or closed, right? It's not a, a valve that says you go this way or that way. It's just open or closed. So in the open position, it would allow oil to go either or well, both. It's going to allow the oil to go through the cooler and bypass the cooler. There. Now it's going to be ready. All right. So it can go either which way. So which way do you think it's going to go when, when the vernotherm valve is cold and shrunk down and the passage is open? Either. Oh, it can go either which way. So which way is it going to want to go? Path of least resistance. least resistance. There we go. So it's going to bypass the cooler because the cooler has all those little tiny passages. It takes more pressure to push it to that. So it's just going to bypass it. Yeah, maybe a little bit goes through there, but that's just fine. It would be the warmer, thinner oil anyway. So most of it's just going to go out, down, and go this way into the tank. So as the oil heats up, this is going to expand. And it is then going to block off the passage going this way. And so all the oil now has to go this way and down into the cooler, where the oil is going to get coolered. All right. So vernotherm valves, they are a nuisance. There is no sudden. It's a slow thing. Okay. We should do. I should get some water and foil it. And we should watch it expand. Remind me of break. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So it, it doesn't happen quickly. It's kind of a slow process, and a slow process the other way. Uh, there's been ADs and service bulletins on these things. What happened is this little nut that crimps on the end. The nut broke off on a bunch of them, and all the parts just kind of fell into the engine. So. That was bad. Well, he's trained. He alerted me. Okay. See you at home. Uh, so, yeah. So, that's what's happening. Um, did that answer the question? Yes. All right. I was distracted. All right. So, vernotherm valve. Oh, and they had that problems. All right. So, uh, tell you what another problem is. This is... When it comes down to troubleshooting, I can say the reason why you need to know all of this stuff isn't because, like, 
you're supposed to design a system and you need to know how to where this goes when you design your system. You have to know what's going on in the engine because you get weird things happening. Why do you need to know the flow of oil through an engine? Well, one of the things that happens often is that a, uh, a pilot can come to you and say, look, I am, I am having some serious trouble with my oil temperature. My oil temperature is just always off the charts. I've taken it to every mechanic in town. I've had all the baffle seals replaced. I've, you know, siliconed everything up with high temp silicone every passageway. There's airflow through it. And what is your next thought going to be? I know what it is. Your temperature gauge is off. I need to calibrate your temperature gauge. And the pilot's going to say, man, the last, no, use that generically. I just had that done. The last mechanic also calibrated my temperature gauge. The temperature gauge is accurate. Now what? What about it? Might be broken. Might be broken. Very good. Yeah, somebody else said that too, and I just put a new one in. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, that was really good, actually. That that's good. It went to that. Birth valve could be broken. Well, cool. I was hoping somebody would say that. That definitely is a consideration. Something you should almost go for. I mean, right in that same. It's almost like it's. This is not shotgunning it. These are legitimate. This is what it can be. Almost in that order. So, is your baffle seal good? Um, is your temperature gauge, the baffle seal goes bad all the time, so there's never, uh, we'll talk about that next, but it's the rubber seals that keep the air flowing through the engine. Um, so make sure all those seals are good, and they go bad so often, and they're never perfect, so it's always good to start there. Next thing is, okay, temperature gauge might be lying to you. Um, verify that it's not, now, now we've got a gauge that's legitimately telling us that we have hot oil. So, um, these things are moving parts, so hey, they do they do go bad. So I go right for this. Do those have a cycle expectancy? Like it's expanded X amount of times, or it's just once it starts to fail, just that's when it's. If you have a problem with it, put a new one in. I mean, this is why I, I suppose this company rejected this one here. They didn't even say why. And it could be part of the service instruction uh, bulletin or AD that came out that said take them out. Uh, the thing I like about this one is that you can see the wear marks where it's seating, and this one you can't. So you can see that it's got a little conical thing. And so, okay, so anyway, uh, we'll get back to that. But I uh, just want to say those are all excellent, excellent ideas. There wasn't a bad idea in it. I've had to go through every one of those. When was the last time your oil cooler was flushed? Had any metal go through the engine? Um, we have you replaced the Vernathurn valve, on and on and on. All right, and there have been, this one has stumped many, many mechanics. Never stumped you guys, because you're going to know the answer in a second. But you can see right here the conical part where it seats. How about that? <clears throat> A little something sitting there. Maybe something went through and this closed. And what is this closed against? A seat. What kind of seat? What's it made out of? Cast iron. It's the case aluminum. It's just the case. Or the adapter in this case, because it usually sits right about here in a light combing. There's an adapter that goes out here for the spin on, so it sits right there. So, all right, so it's just this adapter. Um, what if this isn't seating well? So now we have a seat issue. So there have been many a times I've had to go in and fix that seat. But then somebody would say, well, you know, I can look at this. And, okay, there's some few. It's seating most of the way around. You guys take a look at this. You'll see it. It's seating most of the way around. Is that a problem? Yeah. yeah. The, the weird problem is, is that it's not a problem that it's leaking a little bit of oil. The problem is, where is the temperature bulb located? Right on the other side of that. So here you have 90% of the oil coming around, getting cool, coming through, and going, going into the engine. But you've got a leak of hot oil right next to the probe. So it's lying to you. It's sensing the hot oil coming through. And so it's thinking that the engine's getting all this hot oil when, in fact, the engine's not getting much of hot oil. Just the hot oil just happened to go past that. And uh, so anyway, the seats go bad on these things often. Not this so much, but in the engine. So then you have to have special tools to go in there and, and lap them in and stuff. So you got to watch for that. Uh, all right, so oil cooler, we got vernatherm valve. Okay, this is going to be important to understanding the test material. Um, just going to need to remember a cold valve is an open valve. 
So if the oil is cold, the vernotherm has shrunk and both passages are open. So it's open and allows um, cold oil to bypass the oil cooler. As oil heats up, vernotherm expands. By the way, vernotherm is a lycoming term. Continental does not use that term. Uh, vernotherm expands and closes. Closes out the bypass route, forcing oil through the cooler. And a couple of other notes here. Let's see about engines. Um, dry sump. Dry sump, it is, let's see, scavenge pump. From the scavenge pump, what's the next thing? The burn thermal. Yep, it'd be the oil control valve in this case, but vernotherm. And then... Tanked. Then tank. Oops, no. Or, or oil cooler. Cooler, then tank. And a wet sump. Uh, we have oil pump to bypass valve. to oil cooler, to filter, sort of. It's not always that way because Continental puts their coolers up front, which we should put it where there's fresh air up there. So if the cooler's up front and the pump's in the back, then it can't really go that way. So it has to go up through the pump, through the screen, into the oil gallery, all the way to the front of the engine where the vernotherm is, well, it's not a vernotherm on a Continental, but the oil uh, control valve is in the front of the engine, which then sets its path, then to the rest of the engine. So it's just a little bit different. Kevin, on the right sump, uh -huh. sh shouldn't you have an oil pump as well there? Well, I didn't do the whole thing. I was oh. kind of worried about more where the cooler is in regards oh. to everything. So on a Continental, I'd say these two are kind of flipped. The filter comes back over here. Oil, let me see. Oil is usually cooled after it has run through the engine. And before it, before it is sent to the tank or pumped to the engine. Like on a light combing, it's going to come up through, the, through the, the suction screen, through the pump, pump to the vernotherm. Vernotherm will run it through either the oil cooler to the screen and out, or to the screen and then to the engine. So it's kind of last thing it does before it goes to the engine. And that's all the wet sump. Um, that's kind of all what I just said on all the engines. Okay. So, 
These just kind of basic notes here. See, each engine is different. The problem is your Q&As kind of make it that they're not. So I'm trying to tell you what it is and, and help you do the Q&As at the same time. Oil temp is taken before or after it goes into the engine? Before. So let's see, oil temp should be at least 180 degrees. What happens if it's not at least 180 degrees? Water will evaporate. There you go. Water's not going to evaporate out of the oil. So to boil off vapors. Oh, water, say water vapor. All right, what's the problem with that statement? Not always degrees. Where, where does water boil? 212. 212. Are we, are we a little off from uh, 212? Yeah, but still water will evaporate quicker than it would be at like, you know, room temperature. It's going to get hotter. Because the engine increases it by 50 degrees? There you go. <laughs> Yeah. It has to do with air pressure around it. <laughs> Which is why the, the Which is why the, 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 the what? <laughs> uh engine gas 50 degrees of heat to the oil. The oil. So if you have 180 plus 50 I don't know, you do the math, that's about 230 degrees. But what's your red line based off? Is it based on what's coming out of the engine or going into the engine? Going in. Going in. Going in. They don't want you to know what's coming out. It'd scare you. <laughs> Stupid pilot. Uh, unless you're a pilot, you're not allowed to say that. <laughs> you, can. you can pilot. You can say that. Pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Only in your own head. <laughs> and not if you're a customer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. All right. I think that kind of covers everything I need to cover about oil. Well, I'll just throw this out there. Um, aerobatic engines. If you're, let's see, what do I want to see? Lycoming has an AEIO series of engines. What does that stand for? Aerial uh, Aerobatic Engine Injected Opposed, AEIO. And they also have an AIO. <clears throat> so the difference between an AEIO and an AIO. <laughs> Ready to know? I don't know. Would it be the aerobatic? The engine um, I don't think I, I. This this particular engine here is a normal. So they, it looks like a normal engine. I've never seen the AE engine. If I've got this right, hopefully I do. The AE engine was a very expensive engine produced by Lycoming with an actual oil sump on both sides of the engine. Completely different case, a very special case, and everything was. And I said, I've never seen one, and I heard that they're horribly rare and expensive. Uh, but you can get an AIO, which is an engine that is set up by the factory to be an aerobatic engine, but it has a normal looking case, and normal, everything about it looks normal, just like what we're looking at here on this, on this picture here. Very normal looking engine. The difference is it probably has a much thicker prop flange. Uh, it probably has a, um, a thicker, um, not only the flange, but the front of the crankshaft is thicker. Things about it a little bit beefier. Um, it's set up more to do aerobatics from that standpoint. But in addition, 
they have this system on here. And often this is called the Kristen inverted oil system. So you can just simply add this as a bolt-on system that you can add to an engine, and it works quite well. So in the normal flight category, hey, remember that you guys have a breather. Um, you're supposed to. On almost all light combings, it's up here, but this particular one is in the back. It works the same if it's here or there. So during normal operation, you have this little, this little guy right here is right here, and this is this part right here. And so this is an air-oil separator. Um, I just noticed it's Kristen 803, so it's definitely the Kristen system. All right, so what's going to happen during normal operations? You have normal breather going through here, breather overboard, and of course, if you remember, the breather is because you have some blow by past the rings, the case gets pressurized, and if you didn't relieve that pressure, what's going to happen? Something's got to give. What's going to give? What's that? No, it's not going to blow the engine up. Oil seal is going to push out. And the oil seal pushes out, then the oil is going to come out of here and go that way and get all over the windshield. It makes it hard to see. <laughs> I was laughing because that's like that's the least of your problems at that point. Uh, okay, so it makes it hard to see, so you don't want to make it hard to see. Then you have to add windshield wipers, and that adds weight, right? So, okay, so in a normal operation, so you have to breathe the crankcase so you don't get oil out this way. All right, so normal operation. Um, we have a suction line. Suction line comes up through, around through here, up through here, through the pump. Remember, it doesn't go through the middle. It goes through on the outside, into the engine just like normal, falls down to the sump, and there we go. Um, all of this oil particulate here, this is really isn't doing anything. It's just going overboard, really. Um, this fills up, so ignore that. So everything works like normal. When you go upside down, and mind you, you have to have the G's going the right way, uh, what happens is all the oil falls down to here. The oil pump still an oil pump, still got to pump oil. But it sucks it up through this breather that it used to be here. This gets closed off and so that it doesn't fill up. And it just sucks it up. The little balls change position, reroute it, comes through here, pumps it through, and right down in here. And then where they used to have the oil suction tube, um, sorry, this one, it was, that now becomes your breather. So it's a very simple system. What closes that off? Is it what? These these are pretty large ball bearings, about that big around. They're they're big and they're heavy, and so when you go upside down, so is it gravity? Though? And the yeah the gravity does it. Now if you did like a barrel roll or something, uh, aileron roll where the gravity actually stayed going through the center, uh, positive G's. If you kept positive G's, the whole thing wouldn't work. Doesn't need to. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you go negative G's, then little balls drop, and then... So it's just heavy enough that it's not going to push it open. Yep. All right, we talked about that. Um, we'll come back to that. All right, that will do us for oil systems. I hope. Good luck. <laughs> it's so much to cover, and then, like I said, it gets... Do your Q&A's, you'll be fine. All right, let's move on to cooling systems. All right, I gotta short my notes up a little bit. I have a whole bunch of things to talk about. Uh, Overheating an engine is bad. I think you can figure that out. Is that all magic spells? Yeah. And what cools aircraft engines? Air. 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 So we must have air flow. <coughs> you guys have seen the gigantic cooling fins. Why I have a picture of these right here is to remind me to tell you that there are two different styles of cylinder head temp gauges. So what we have as far as the, the pilot instrumentation that's telling us that our engine is running hot or not are really two indications. Uh, one is the oil temp probe. Two is a cylinder head temp probe. That's pretty much all you get. There's also an exhaust gas temp probe, but that's for used for something else. So we'll talk about that. 
and the back eight weeks, but that's really not an indication of engine temperature. In fact, it's the opposite. The hotter that gets, the cooler your engine runs and vice versa. So can't watch your EGT gauge for oil for, for engine health reasons. So there are two types of probes. This one right here uh, is called a spark plug style. It goes underneath the spark plug. This little thing right there, that's actually a spark plug gasket. Now here's the funny thing that I've never been able to answer. Whenever you work on spark plugs, I told you guys, you take off the copper what? What's it called? It's actually not a washer, it's a, it's a gasket. You take off the copper gasket, and what do you do with old gaskets? You throw old gaskets away. Never reuse old gaskets. All right, except, unless you're using this system right here, where the probe is part of the gasket, then you always reuse the gasket. <laughs> All right, not my rule. So um, some people joke and say that this system, this one right here, is not a very good system at all, and they call this a spark plug temperature probe because it just tells you what the, plug, the temperature of the spark plug is. This style right here is called a bayonet style, and if you actually have noticed on your cylinders, there's a little hole right there. And I laugh because some of your engines, people have taken the time to plug that little hole. Uh, that little hole doesn't go to anywhere. And if it actually went into the combustion chamber, we would have bigger problems that I don't think that your plug would actually hold. But the probe goes right there. And so that is an internal probe that measures the cylinder head temp. So it's a cylinder head temp probe. That is the much better, much preferred way of looking at cylinder head temperatures. What was the name you gave it? Bayonet. B-A-Y-O-N-E-T. Bayonet. So if you were running these, would you be running an engine analyzer on it? Uh -huh. I, I installed uh, a four... I have people laugh at me because uh, my airplane, my little 150, came with an oil temp gauge. That's it. There's no cylinder head temp, no exhaust gas temp, no nothing. And uh, I was silly enough to add a four probe cylinder head temp and EGT probe system to my aircraft. Why? Because uh, I'm a mechanic and I want to I want to look. I want to know. So so I added that to mine. Right, discard. All right. Before we make a bunch of notes here, I think we'll we'll talk about what's going on inside of an engine. So it's critical that your engine actually has the cowling on it. Uh, I, I see far too many engines out there where people are like, well, it's an air-cooled engine, I'll take the cowling off, there's definitely air around it, and the cylinders are definitely, the prop's blowing air over the cylinder, so it must work. But as an assembly, uh, and I kind of break it down into, you have baffles and baffle seals, if you will. And, let me see here, there we go. Oh, that's a really good picture. All right, so all of this right here with this aluminum, that's what I would refer to as engine baffling. And all of this nasty looking rubber right here, this is a don't. Um, notice this is improperly. Uh, this is all baffle seal. This stuff wears out. So when I say baffling, I'm talking about the aluminum parts that go, go around the engine and this, the baffle seal is the rubber parts. Uh, let's see, we'll come back to some of this. Looking for a good example here. Oh, that's a pretty one right there. Right. Oops. We'll go back to this gorgeous looking. What is that? Bonanza. That's a bonanza. All right. So what is, if you were to run this engine, well, this bottom cowling doesn't come off of this airplane. Just open the door. But uh, if you were to run this engine with, with the cowling off of it, what happens is the air just kind of comes through here and just swirls around like that, and that doesn't really do any good for the engine whatsoever. And it kind of, kind of goes by it. It just bakes out. So bad, bad, bad. Uh, what you need to have happen is the air needs to come through this, this center opening here, and it is forced down and around these cylinders. So in between these cylinders, there's actually more, you can't see it, and that's what I was looking for, more baffling that is up close. You know how your engines have, the heads are really close, but then you have all the space down here where the steel barrels are? There's actually baffle that takes up that space in here. 
that forces the air in and around through all of the fins. And so that's what, if I can erase this. Do you know how to erase that? Uh, just escape. Yeah. All right, I guess we can do that. I was looking for the easy way to do it. All right, so the air's got to come down. It's going to be forced down through all of these cylinders back there. Uh, there's little holes right here. There's one right there. And that is fresh air inlet. So this one's going to go through this hose. It may be for the cabin. These are uh, little blast, blast tubes. They were probably going to be cooling the magneto or um, not the alternator because the alternator is sitting up front on this one, which makes this what kind of case? Uh, no. It's <coughs> per mold. There. there we go. Per mold, not sand cast. And we know it's continental because? It says on my It's right there. <laughs> all right. Guys, we're learning. All right. So we got all that. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I know. I want this one. All right. So what's then what's happening is on top of the aircraft, on top of the engine, sorry, we have high pressure. High pressure means what velocity? Low velocity. And on the bottom, we have low pressure, which means high velocity. Okay, you got to get that because I think that's some Q&A stuff. So how do we make it high pressure, low velocity up here, and then low pressure, high velocity down below? Venturi. There you go. Venturi will do that. What this picture isn't showing is that the exit area usually has some sort of lip like that, and the airplane fuselage is here. So it creates a little venturi effect right here. So that creates a low pressure in this area and draws the air out. In fact, um, mm -hmm. some aircraft have uh, cowl flaps. And cowl flaps means that this little thing right here is adjustable. So I can have it streamlined, which would be cowl flaps closed, or down, cowl flaps open. And you can control the cooling. Yeah, those, right? But yours are probably electric too, huh? No, no, they're not. Really? And Alex cannot move. Poor Alex. He lost his strength with the hair. All right, let's uh, pause and we will take a break. <laughs>